Alright, organic oxidation states. This is the last part of the first lecture. And going back to the molecule that we talked about before in the bone line format, what we're going to look at is not the number of hydrogens present on it, although that will be a prerequisite for what we're about to do, but rather we're going to concentrate on the oxidation state of each one of the carbons. First, I want to present the structure in the condensed formula, the one that tells you how many carbons total, how many hydrogens total, etc., etc., for the rest of the molecule you have here. And if you follow your typical rule of redox chemistry, you'll say, well, oxygen tends to have a 2 minus charge. Sulfur, being more electronegative than carbon, is also probably going to have a 2 minus charge. Nitrogen, being more electronegative than carbon, may have a minus 3 charge. And hydrogen, being less electronegative than carbon will be plus one. And so you might apply that rule to figure out the charge of carbon. And uh, what, you're gonna, what you're gonna end up finding out is that something weird happens. You end up with some bizarre numbers for the oxidation state of carbon. Um, in particular, if you simply multiply the, the top number by the bottom number, and here I have an X for carbon because we don't know what the charge is yet, you have 22 times x, you have 26 times 1, 2 times minus 3, 5 times minus 2, and 1 times minus 2. So you end up with the entire sequence right here. And the entire molecule is neutral, so the summation of all these charges has to equal 0. So we have 22x plus 26 minus 6 minus 10 minus 2 equals 0, which means that 22x uh, plus 8, right, because 26 minus 6 is 20, 20 minus 10 is 10, 10 minus 2 is 8, all right? So 22 plus 8 equals 0. Subtract 8 from both sides and divide by 22. This is the charge of carbon, minus 8, 22, or minus 4, 11. You know, like, that sounds bizarre. Like, what the heck is that, right? And the reason why we're getting these weird numbers for carbon is because not all the carbons are the same type of carbon, as we already saw just by looking at the different number of hydrogens that they have. So the condensed formulas are not ideal for carbon. Um, what they represent is the average, the average charge of all of the carbons, but it's not the individual charge. So in order to determine the charges of each one of the carbons, we need to consider the following. First, we only consider those elements that are directly bonded to carbon. If the element to which binds to carbon um, is carbon, then the two of them have the same electronegativity, you're not going to have a pool of electrons either way. So there's no reduction, there's no oxidation, the carbon remains neutral in charge, there's no change in the charge. However, if the element bound to carbon is less electronegative, such as hydrogen, then you're going to have electron pool going towards the carbon. And this is basically taken to the extreme in terms of oxidation and reduction. And we say that, okay, well, in the case where hydrogen binds to carbon, we're going to be reducing the carbon. And for every hydrogen that a carbon has, the charge is going to go down by one unit. So if carbon has two hydrogens, the charge goes down by minus two. If the carbon has three hydrogens, the charge goes, by, goes down by minus three, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, if the atom bound to carbon is more electronegative, then we take it to the extreme again and we say, well, in that case, the electrons will go away from the carbon, making the carbon more positive. So it will oxidize it. Um, and so, for instance, if you have a carbon-oxygen bond, a single bond, the charge of carbon will go up by one unit. If you have a carbon-oxygen double bond, the charge will go up by two units because you have two bonds to that oxygen. And another way to look at it is that reduction will be a minus charge for every single bond to hydrogen. An oxidation will be a plus one charge for every single bond to an electronegative element like oxygen, nitrogen, the halogens, or sulfur. Okay, so now let's take a look at this example once more and see what the true nature of the charges are. All right, let's start with the carbon over here. Now that carbon already has four bonds. Uh, three of them are to oxygen atoms, and one of them is to carbon. The bond to the other carbon 
doesn't contribute any charge so that you you basically can ignore it if you want but you do have bonds to three other oxygens and oxygen is more electronegative than carbon therefore the charge goes up by one unit for each one bond to the oxygens and in other words the charge of that carbon is plus three all right now let's focus on this carbon over there this carbon is bound to two other carbons on the structure and because it only has two bonds it must have two bonds to two uh, independent hydrogens. So you have two carbon hydrogen bonds over here, um, which means that you're going to decrease the charge of the carbon by two units, one for each hydrogen. The carbon carbon bonds, once again, can be ignored because they don't decrease or increase charge. So this carbon has now a minus two charge. All right. Now, if you basically follow that same approach, there's a bunch of other carbons that follow the same criteria. Basically, all the bent carbons that are bound to carbon, 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 carbon are going to have that two minus charge. Okay, now let's take a look at this carbon over here. All right, this carbon is bound to another carbon, so you ignore that, but it's also bound to a sulfur. Now, that's only two connections, which means that you have to have two hydrogens on that carbon. The two hydrogens bring down the charge to two minus, but at the same time, that carbon is bound to a sulfur, which is more electronegative. So that will bring the charge up by one unit. So you have two minus from the two hydrogens, one plus from the sulfur. So altogether, this carbon has a charge of minus one. And you can find the same case for the carbon over here on the other end of that sulfur and the carbon up there next to that nitrogen. Okay, now let's take a look at this carbon here. This has four bonds already, so there's no hydrogens on it. Uh, three of the bonds are to other carbons, so you ignore those three bonds, but one of the bonds is to oxygen, so that will increase the bond charge, or that will increase the charge of the carbon up to plus one. Okay, and we have one more instance of that happening, specifically for the carbon here, which is quaternary, because you have the four bonds already on carbon. Three of them are to carbons, but the last one is to a nitrogen, that's giving you that plus one charge. All right, looking down here, you have three bonds on that carbon, which means that you have to have a hydrogen, and you ignore the bonds to the other carbons. The hydrogen decreases the charge of the carbon to minus one, so that's a minus one. Over here, this carbon has two bonds to carbon, so you ignore them, one bond to hydrogen, that's a minus one, and one bond to nitrogen, that's a plus one. Minus one plus one gives you zero. So this carbon has neutral charge. The carbon down here is got connections to one, two, and three, basically four connections to other carbons. So that is also neutral. Okay, and that's also true for the carbon right here. This is connection to four other carbons. This carbon right here is connected to four other carbons. So zero, 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 zero. Okay, now let's take a look at this terminal carbon. This carbon, because it's terminal, has to have three hydrogens. Each one of them contribute negative one charge to the carbon, so that's negative three. But the nitrogen takes away an electron. So that gives you plus one charge for the carbon. So minus three plus one is equal to minus two on that carbon. And that brings us to the other terminal carbon, three hydrogen still, but now that carbon is connected to another carbon. So only the effect of the hydrogen is felt, giving you a negative three charge on that specific carbon. Okay, and that basically brings up the entire total of all the charges and as you can see none of the charges are fractions none of the charges are um, you know crazy fractional values that make no sense everything is either minus one plus one minus two plus two zero plus three minus three etc etc and when you incorporate those values in here something interesting happens well first of all the sulfur it's not actually minus two. In fact, the sulfur is connected to two oxygens via four bonds, so that's a plus four, but it's connected to two carbons, so that's a minus two. Plus four minus two is plus two, so the sulfur is actually plus two in oxidation. That we wouldn't have known 
if we didn't have the actual structure, the Lewis structure uh, drawn out. So that changes things a bit. And if you do the math with that uh, little change, you find out that the overall charge is negative 6 elevenths as opposed to negative 4 elevenths that we calculated before. Now, if you add up all of the charges that we got for all of the carbons, you get the following value right here, which divided by all 22 carbons present gives us, unsurprisingly, negative 6 elevenths, which is the average value of all the charges. So this is a you know pretty thorough example of how you find those charges, but we're going to use this idea of looking at the charges to explain some of the spectroscopic characteristics of molecules and maybe even some of the reactivity. Okay, so with that we have finished the first lecture of organic chemistry. Um, some of that may be uh, a review from what you've learned in general chemistry. Some of it may be completely new and some of it may look a little bit more advanced than you've ever seen before. Don't worry too much. Um, we can discuss all these things during um, our class meetings and office hours. Um, and as you'll see, uh, the most important parts are really understanding your octet rule, your vesper structures, your resonance structures. Those are really important. Hybridization, I'm going to push to a certain extent. Uh, and MO theory, aside from frontier orbitals, I'm not really going to push too much on that. But being able to use the idea of the shapes of the molecules and the intermolecular forces is going to be something we're going to continue uh, discussing in future lectures. Uh, and of course, the bone line formulas, that's going to be the new norm. From here on out, everything is going to be bone line formulas. So that you want to get very familiar with right away. Okay, so with that being said, I will see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.